welcome to the Your Data Driven Podcast. If you like this podcast, be sure to visit our website at yourdatadriven.com for more useful help and advice on setting up your race car, mastering data analysis, and driving faster. Welcome to episode three. My guest today is Ross Bentley. Yes, the Ross Bentley. Famous IndyCar and sports car driver, international driver coach, and author of the Speed Secret series of books. What Ross doesn't know about driving and driving improvement isn't worth knowing. Today's show is packed full of tips and insights from Ross's world. So grab a pen and paper, sit back, and let's enjoy what Ross has to say. So hello, Ross. Hey, Samira. How are you doing? I'm very well. I'm very well. Thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. It's unusual times we find ourselves, but hopefully people will still be interested in motorsport when we come out the other end. Yeah, maybe what's going to happen is we're just going to be itching to get back that much more. And what's the what's the old saying about love or something like that? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, absence makes the heart goes go from there yeah. and all that. So. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Thank you again for, for taking the time. This is going to be a fascinating conversation, I, I hope, for the audience. It would be lovely to get a bit of background on yourself and what you're doing for those who don't know who you are. But equally, it would be lovely to hear specifically around the work you do in terms of coaching. Some of the tips and techniques that you suggest to the people who you coach, maybe so that the audience here can get some takeaways and think, actually, yeah, that's a really good tip that I would never have thought of. And they get some real benefit of your thoughts on the outcome of that one and yeah and see, see how people can improve their driving because that's really your focus today but tell us a little bit about Ross and you didn't start off as a driver coach I think you've done a bit of driving yourself yeah okay I prefer <laughs> to talk about other people than I do myself but I was one of those guys fortunate enough to grow up in a family that my father worked on and built race cars and took me to my first race when I was five years old we grew up in Vancouver in Canada and sort of in that Pacific Northwest area Western Canada Western Northwest US and and he was involved with oval track racing. So sprint cars, big wings, all that kind of stuff. And so I grew up around that part of the sport, oval racing, but all on the way, started reading magazines and fell in love with Grand Prix racing and sports car racing and things as well. So I wanted to go and race the Indy 500, win Le Mans and win Monaco. I mean, what else would any young kid want to do, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, just, just those things, that's all. And made a career driving cars, got to the point where I was driving Indy cars. I always say I got to the point where I was driving underfunded Indy cars, probably the lowest budgeted team in Indy car racing at a time when, you know, that was the early to mid 90s when, you know, a lot of people say kind of it was the heyday of Indy car racing when there was uh, Mario and Michael Andretti and Al Unser Jr. and Rick Mears was still there and Bobby Rahal and this guy named Nigel Mansell came over. I was going to say, and, didn't, you, didn't you have this fellow yeah. Nigel Mansell pop over? Red yeah, five. you know, he popped over for a little <laughs> while and uh, played with us and up to Paul Tracy and then getting into when Zanardi was just starting and stuff. And that was kind of the the real heyday of IndyCar racing in terms of if a team didn't have a new spec chassis and engine every year and updated spec engines throughout the year, you weren't competitive. And I was typically driving a one or two year old chassis with about a four generation old engine. So kind of the the whole goal at that point was to make an impression enough to be able to move up to the next level of teams. But um, really kind of struggled with that. Never quite made that got that got that opportunity. I mean, first off, uh, you made it there. I mean, this is like, hang, you should always talk about it in like quite a modest way, but people listening are going, hang on, you're racing at the top level in North America. <laughs> I mean, a single seat level with all these guys. I mean, it's, that's, a, that's, that's a great achievement. Well, it's funny. I was talking to somebody the other day, and, and if I had a dollar for every time a, a driver who I had raced against when I was sort of coming up from club racing to making my way up there, who, who told me that, they should have been in indie cars because they always kick my butt, right? That's yeah. what they, they say. And the whole thing of, yes, you have to have the skill and the talent and the ability to drive a car fast, but typically the drivers that make it there, they just want it more. I'm not going to bore you with stories of all the sacrifices and things that any driver has to go through to make it to that kind of a level. And Perry McCarthy's book, Flat Out and Flat Broke, it was a great example of the stories, that the ones that make it to the top level and everything aligns. They're with the best team. They win. They've got the ability, all that kind of stuff. There are some drivers that make it to the top level and just don't quite have what it takes. 
And there's a bunch of drivers that are kind of in the middle. They have what it takes, but they just didn't quite get the right team, car, everything aligned in there. But to get to that level, yeah, there, it takes a lot of takes a lot of commitment, a lot of sacrifice. But fortunately for me, after a couple of three or four years of kind of struggling there, I had some teams come from IMSA, some sports car teams with prototype cars, call me up and say, would you come and test? And I would go and test. And at that time in IndyCar racing, I was making no money, like literally no money and barely surviving my wife and I. And all of a sudden, the sports car teams were coming along and saying, we'll pay you to drive our car. I'm like, what? (laughs) Pay me to drive your car? I can remember testing testing at Sebring. We went to a three-day test at Sebring and I'm driving around and and I'm literally laughing in my helmet. (laughs) thinking, you're paying me to do this. I don't have to work. Like if I crash the car, I just walk away and wait for them to fix it. Like it, it, Oh my God. So then I, I spent a bunch of years driving in IMSA, which went through that whole IMSA, American Le Mans series, Grand Am, all those different kind of variations on that, on that sports car racing scene. And won, won a championship, uh, won Daytona 24, you know, nice. fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time with a couple of those teams and things that, that at that time. And, you know, I had a good time there. But I think the very first thing that I ever did when I first started racing was I went to a racing school. I went to the Jim Russell School. And at the end of it, they asked me, do you want to stay and be, become an instructor? And I didn't. But it, it kind of planted a seed of, what well, I, could, I could do that too. Like I could instruct other people. And I guess I've always enjoyed teaching. And I think to be a great teacher, you have to be a great learner. And I always say that I'm addicted to learning. I'm a learning junkie. And <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's important to be as a racing driver anyway. I think, I think to be, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression is having some exposure to elite level athletes and, and also racing drivers at a top level. The talent is a given because you can drive around in the circle. But just having that awareness and that constantly looking and and trying to learn something new is is something that that the the professionals are doing. But equally, it's something that all the amateur racers could benefit from as well. That same attitude. I think that's it's fascinating. From our our conversations previously, you said like a lot of the people who who you work with now or you're involved with equally like you just fascinated to learn. It, exactly. I, I, I absolutely agree a, a thousand percent in that <laughs> what what separates, I think what separates the ones that are super successful from the ones who are much less successful is that desire to kind of put the ego out of the way and say, yeah. but I got more to learn. And again, if I had a dollar for every driver <laughs> that said, you know, I want to be the best, whatever, I want to be the best Formula One driver. I want to be the best sports car driver. I want to be the best amateur racer. I want to be the best gentleman driver. But the ones that truly will put the effort in to do what it takes, it's a very small percentage. I have a coaching client right now who is, well, he he inspires me to be a, a better coach because of his work ethic at early 50s. He wants it as bad as any young kid trying to make it to Formula One. And he will put the effort in and just work at it and do whatever whatever it takes to make it, to be the best gentleman driver. And that's inspiring. And it's the reason why he has made so much progress in a short period of time. That's the difference. Yeah, yeah there's a kind of balancing act between overthinking things. And people say, oh, he's too analytical and he's still analyzing when he's out on the track and that sort of slows him down. Or he can do a lap on his own, but then in traffic or in a race, it's sort of he's overthinking things and he's slow. You know what I mean? There's, there's a kind of balancing act between the right time to be doing different things because you can overthink things. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. I think that's another thing that separates the very, very best. Those ones that are real special is they have that ability to be analytical up to a certain point and then kind of just turn the brain off and trust what I say, their mental programming to drive the car. And I think that concept is exaggerated or maybe more more visible at a place like Indianapolis. But the Speedway and the Indy 500, mm-hmm. that whole world, because the the line between getting the car set up right and trusting the car and then just being brave. Uh, it's <laughs> yes, a really, they go pretty really, quick these days. <laughs> it's a really fine line. Yeah. And the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is famous for, you know, there's a lot of drivers who have gone there who have been really brave and they're fast mm-hmm. for a little while until they end up in a hospital. Right. And then there are some drivers who are super analytical, super thinking drivers are really good at setting the car up and they're fast, but they just don't get that last tiny, tiny little bit of speed out of, out of the car. 
And then you get the greats, the Rick Mears and right now Scott Dixon, Alexander Rossi, who have this ability to think about the car. They can work on the setup up to a certain point, and then they just shut their brain off and just drive. And that's when the magic really happens. I think that's quite hard to do. Yeah, absolutely. And, but it's part of a person's mental programming. And, and I work with young drivers. I work with gentlemen drivers. And one of the things when I work with gentlemen drivers, a lot of them have come to the sport later in life after being successful in business. And okay. one of the things that made them successful in business was thinking and analyzing and building their business. And they've made a lot of money because of that. And they come to, into our sport and they take the exact same approach and they, they're very analytical in their driving. And they can't let go of that part of it. And I work out a little cue or I call it a mental trigger. And a lot of times I'll just get on the radio and say, drive, stupid. <laughs> and that's kind of like the cue to say, Seriously? Oh, I got I to turn my brain off and drive stupid. Like, yeah, not, yeah, stop okay. thinking and trust that the programming, all the work that I've done will look after me. And Obviously, that takes a, a strong inner confidence, inner belief that, oh, I've got that. I can trust myself to do it. And I think that's where, again, that's where that last tiny little bit of what it takes to be special comes from. Yeah. My interest is a lot in, in the data and the analytics, but clearly our race as well. So I've personally found it difficult to switch off because you can you get absorbed into the numbers and yeah. the numbers will say, oh, OK, you can do better here. But the thing is, if you, if you find yourself thinking about that too much when you're out on the track, it's like a distraction. It's taking up energy and you just sort of have to like let go and let it kind of come more naturally. But I wish I had someone like you whispering in my ear. I guess we all did. When you can sort of see it, it's like, actually, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, and that's, that's what Lewis Hamilton does at a, yeah. at a level that we kind of stand back and go, oh, he's just naturally like that. No, that's yeah. something that he's worked on and developed and has been trained or programmed into him over many years. He can be very analytical, and yet there comes a point in time where he's not thinking. He's just doing. And I don't take that away as a not thinking. I mean, he's a very smart driver, but he also knows when it's time to just be a racer. Very rarely does he make a mistake, but oh, where was that last year, Brazil, when he hit? Uh, but that was him just doing yeah. and yeah the downside is every now and then you're going to make a little mistake what i loved uh, about that is he 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 was he showed great oh kind of leadership yes. and just said yeah it was me yeah <laughs> was just, just, sorry <laughs> i was just like that never happens <laughs> the, the great is thing is, is that you know the thing that's great to see about a guy like hamilton is 10 years ago he would not have done that he would not have apologized he, he would have said that corner was mine. But that comes with experience and confidence and kind of going, I don't really have anything to prove anymore. Sure, I want to prove more, but I don't have to. I don't need to win this race to prove the fact that I'm one of the greats of all time. He knows. Everybody knows. So he's OK now just saying, oh, I screwed it, guys. Sorry. But again, a, a younger driver wouldn't have said that because they don't have that maturity and experience yet. Would Max Verstappen have, have apologized at that point in time? <laughs> I'll, I'll wait just hear, hear him apologize for anything i'm sure he will I, I, mean, no, I, th I think he i think he, he's he play, he's playing the game isn't he he's playing the game and uh well, that's that's it, part it, of it. you can see that he's he's matured in the last few yeah. years right y yeah i mean i there's more likelihood of him apologizing for something like that today than there would have been three years ago we're talking about these guys who are at the top level, but equally at a club or amateur level, it's the same thing, really. You get the drivers who are confident enough. I think it's, it's basically what we're saying. The underlying thing is confidence or self-confidence. And, and Lewis has got it and Max has got it <laughs> in a different way. And then maybe the younger drivers don't. And, and so maybe the, the point is you've got the self-confidence to go up to someone and say, actually, yeah, sorry, that was that was my fault. They might still be pretty upset with you about it, but at least... You're trying to make amends a bit <laughs> if it was your fault. And equally, you'd expect the same the other way around. And at the end of the day, it's the driver's inner belief that more than confidence, it's an inner belief that really separates them. Oh, you know, tell I us think, more about this because you've written about this quite a bit. So what do you mean by that? Well, a great example was in those years within Mercedes when it was Hamilton and Rosberg. Mm. And almost from race to race, you could almost see who had the most belief in themselves. Mm. And... 
over the course of those years, Hamilton had it more than Rosberg did. But every now and then, you could see a weekend where, for whatever reason, Hamilton was not quite on his game, and mm-hmm. Rosberg was. And you could kind of see that ebb and flow over time. And so many factors play into this that at that level, where the difference is, and you're the data guy, like it's, I don't know what it is, but the difference is probably like 0.01%, right? And if I believe 0.01% more in myself than you do, I've got an advantage. And yeah. I think with anything, we go through a stage or stages of you're starting up in racing or you're in club racing or you're not making a living at this yet <laughs> or ever. There's a certain point in there where you kind of go, wow, I've seen somebody do that corner flat. So it can be done. But deep down inside, I can't do it yet. And then eventually it's like, well, somebody else can do it. So I could do that. And then there comes uh, the next level is sort of, well, I could, not only could I do that, but I could actually see myself doing that mentally. Like I can see myself in my mind doing that. And then, wow, I almost did that. And now, oh, I did that. Now I can do it. Now I've done it. And then it becomes a, I can do it with my eyes shut. Like it's easy. And it's just, it's part of me. So we build our belief system over time. Some people, I think, build it a little quicker because they perhaps relate it to other things that have happened in their life. I see a lot of drivers that come into the sport having been successful in another sport or another activity. And they walk in kind of with this, a lot of confidence. Mm. Yeah, sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, the, the nice thing about our sport is it does, how can I say, it does, it does expose that in one sense. It's just you in the car when you get out there and there's nowhere to hide. The stopwatch and is it on the track? And are you ahead of the other guy? You know, there's, but what you were talking about there was very positive. And I wonder whether that's how everyone thinks because it's almost like a positive ladder of achievement. You're talking about, do I do the corner flat? And it's a positive thing rather than I can't do it. It's, I can't do it yet. And incrementally, you're working your way up to it. So that's, is that what you're coaching someone and, and say, you need to be working up to this or, or building up to it? Is that kind of what you mean in, in a positive way? Yeah. In fact, it's a big part of my role as a coach is try to manage that. And obviously, if I walk in and I'm working with a driver who cannot take that corner flat right now, mm. um, I could stand there and say, you can you can do it. It's not going to work. Like It's too big a gap. If I said, okay, we're going to work on this process. And by changing your driving technique slightly here, maybe this fast corner, you're going to rather than breathe the throttle as you're entering the corner, which is going to upset the balance of the car, you're going to do it earlier. And you're going to make that breathe of the throttle earlier. And then you're going to be on power as you're going through there. So now the car is flat, it's balanced, it's got more grip. The driver's going, oh, okay, I can understand why that's a benefit. So you're going to make that little breathe beforehand. You're going to be on power going through that fast corner. And now the driver goes on track and they they breathe the throttle before the corner, but they're on power going through it. And they go, ah, okay, now they're starting to build the program. Their foot flat to the floor through this fast corner. But they they kind of gradually built up and it's like, yeah, now you can see that, right? So rather than me just saying, you can do it, take it flat. And by the way, there are coaches slash instructors who think that's what their job is to just, well, I took it flat, so you should take it flat. No, a, like a good coach has to kind of get in the mind of the driver and help them take little steps and build it, build it, build it. And I think that's important. I'm just going to jump in there on the data yeah. side as well. If you're looking at data... You can see it. You can see the opportunity. One of the things that I'm really curious about and I'm interested in everyone's idea is how you go from that point where, okay, so I've seen this in the numbers and I've got the driver there. And even if you're self-coaching, but how do you go from that, well, this can be done to you are doing it? Well, I think like anything, it's the old, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? (laughs) <laughs> I've never heard of that. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Slowly. <laughs> yeah. If, if right now I'm braking for that fast corner and other drivers are taking it flat, to just go from braking for that corner to taking it flat, that's like trying to eat an elephant one whole time, right? It's too mm. big a jump. So whether I'm coaching somebody, you're coaching somebody, you're working with somebody with their data, or a person is self-coaching, they need to help the driver take little steps. And then there are little wins, right? They're like, oh, I did that. Oh, I did that. Oh, I did that. And that, so there's sort of a, there's an improvement in technique, which improves a person's belief. And because of that belief, which comes first, the belief that you can do something or the ability to do something? It's kind of a chicken and egg thing, right? And so you've got to kind of do each one, take little steps. 
and each one builds off the other. And I do it, I get a little more belief. I get a little more belief, that gives me the ability to do it a little more. And so you keep taking those steps. And I think uh, a mistake that I see a lot of drivers make is trying to take too big a jump at one time. The more you can break it down into little bites, little chunks, the more successful you're going to be. Can you give us an example of that? What, what you mean? So say, say for example, it might be a high-speed corner or something like that, like you said, because we're talking about a flat-out corner. So if I'm the driver and I'm looking at this corner, and I, I've got a couple in my mind, actually, for myself, so that there are a couple of corners that I know everyone goes quicker than me. <laughs> at. Uh-huh. So I'm, every time I come to the corner, my foot lifts off the throttle. Like I didn't ask it to, but it, it did. <laughs> yeah. So, so what do I do? <laughs> Velcro works really good. Put Velcro yeah. on the bottom. <laughs> Yeah, bricks or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it, maybe some of the listeners, when Fernando Alonso went to Indianapolis a couple of years ago for the first time, he even talked about that, how going to turn one, it made some comment like, my right foot and my brain are disconnected. Like, my brain is saying, keep my foot down, but my foot keeps lifting for some reason. <laughs> Really? Yeah, I didn't that's think Alonzo, that. you know? So, oh, that makes all, me feel think, a bit better. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I think, first of all, it's the acceptance, a little bit of acceptance of rather than beating yourself up and going, man, I just can't do this. And, and I think that's the first step. And you mentioned this earlier about the kind of the positive approach to it. One of the main things that, that I do as a coach, that I think a coach needs to do and a driver needs to do is frame everything from a, what am I going to do rather than what I'm not going to do. You know, it's like so right easy now, to get into a negative spiral. I mean, I see so many people I race with down in the dumps after a session. Yeah. You do kind of wonder because it's like, we're doing this for fun, guys. And yeah. yet everyone looks really miserable. Yeah. <laughs> There's one person wandering around really happy and then everyone else is miserable. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, that's not right. <laughs> well, and, you know, let's say a bad day at the racetrack is, is better than yeah, a good exactly. day anywhere else, right? But I mean, I say right now, do not think about a pink elephant. What just popped into your head? You pink can't elephant, not think right? of it. You can't not think and of it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of drivers will go, man, I always break early for turn one. Ah, oh, I break early for turn one again. I break. What are you doing? You're reinforcing that you break early for turn one. If you change that around to say, I'm going to break later for turn one. Oh, okay. I can work with that. And then if you get even more specific with it, with I'm going to break one car length later. I'm going to break 20 meters later. Like if you become very specific with it and you kind of go, I'm going to break two car lengths later for turn one, but I'm going to apply the same brake pressure, which means that I'm kind of moving my whole brake zone in. That's going to increase my corner entry speed as well, That which means I'm probably going to have to sort of be a little more careful, more progressive in the way I release the brake pedal to get the car to change direction. And now I'm rotated. And actually, I can see how that's actually going to help me get back to throttle sooner because now the car is rotated, kind of pointing in the direction that I want it to be. Now I've got a a game plan rather than I got to go faster in turn one. I got to stop braking early for turn one. That does not help. But if you go through that process of this is what I'm going to do. And again, not just say I'm going to break later for turn one. Well, where are you breaking now? How much later are you going to break? What's that going to result in? What's that going to mean to your corner entry speed? How's that going to affect the rest of the corner? And if you work through that plan and you take some time and close your eyes, maybe sitting in your car, even turning the steering wheel, moving your feet or sitting in your your trailer or a chair next to your car in the paddock, whatever, and just close your eyes and actually physically move your body while you're imagining yourself doing that, you've just greatly increased your chance of doing it. But not only have you greatly increased your chance of doing it because you've started to build the programming to do it, but you've given your brain, your belief system, a reason to believe that you can do it. So it's kind of how do we increase our belief in ourselves? Knowledge helps. And knowing that we're prepared to do it helps increase that. So it's the process. And the more you, more you can define that process into little chunks, the more likely it is you're going to do it. That's great. I mean, when you're talking about the mental imagery, the, the bobsleigh team kind of come to mind for that. I don't know if you've ever seen the drivers for the bobsleigh. Yeah. So they have their eyes closed and they kind of do this kind of whooshing around, you know, for each corner. But that's basically like what you're talking about like with the pedals and everything like that. And then the other thought I had, which has gone out of my head as I speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, do some mental imagery of what it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So the other, yeah. So the other thought I had was to do with the data side of things and how that can actually help you, particularly with the video. Yes. Because you can actually say, this is what 10 meters later looks like from mm-hmm. your perspective. And I've, I've personally found that really powerful 
to be able to say you are braking here and this is what 10 meters later looks like in terms of and you just you just wind the video forward 10 meters because it's all synced with the distance you just wind it forward 10 meters and go this is what the world looks like at 10 meters further down like because you're traveling quickly it's quite hard to work out you said car length i think car length is probably an easier measure than meters if you say to someone break 20 meters later they'll be like well what does that mean i don't yeah. know what 10 meters i don't know what that means there's no, there's, there's notional board markers out there but they're, they're all randomly positioned from what i can understand <laughs> so it's like well what does 10 meters mean so the nice thing about the data so particularly with the video is you can roll it forward and say well that's what 10 meters look like so give that a go or five meters maybe if you're doing it incrementally in positive steps yeah and when i'm working with drivers a lot of times i will present that kind of information in a few different ways because some drivers are very good oh, at thinking okay. in, in in a distance meters or feet or whatever but a lot of drivers they can picture the length of a car and they can sort of picture that better but you're absolutely right when you can use the data and the video and say right now this is where you're starting to break because you can see that in the data and we just roll it ahead one car length yeah now Get a picture of this and now put that in your brain and really picture that's where you're going to start. Now, there's a whole other thing here in that I think that many drivers get overly focused on what I call the begin of braking, B-O-B, begin of braking. Otherwise, I call it Bob. And, okay. and not enough on the end of braking, E-O-B, E-O-B. And how this came about was many, many years ago when I was, this is when I was early on in my racing career somebody would come along and say, where do you break for turn four? And I'd say, I don't know, like when it feels right. And I'd say, where do you break? And they go, oh, I break at the three marker or the 2.5 marker or whatever. And they knew exactly where they started to break. And I started to realize that, wow, well, that's interesting because I usually outbreak that driver. <laughs> I gain, gain an advantage on the brake. So I would start asking other drivers and I started to notice a trend. The drivers that I could consistently outbreak or do a better job in the braking zone, they could tell me where they started braking. But another driver, I'd ask, where do you brake? And they go, I don't know, when it feels right. And I kind of started to realize that the best brakers seemed to focus more on where they were going to end their braking. And then they would judge the beginning of the braking off of that. Because think about it. I mean, yeah, you could get a yeah. better exit off the previous corner and be 2K faster there. Or you could be in traffic, got held up, and you could be 2K slower. So that begin a breaking point has to change. But if you're focusing on the end of braking, I, I say if you're driving down the highway and a traffic light up ahead turns red, you don't look to the side of the road for a brake reference marker to tell you when to start braking. You look up to the intersection and say, that's where I need to stop. And you judge your braking off of that. For some reason, we flip that around on the track too much. So I think that it's when we focus on that end of braking, first of all, it forces us to look further ahead. It mm -hmm. forces us to think into the corner. And now we start to judge our braking points off of that. And I have found that just getting drivers to kind of change their way of thinking around braking nine times out of 10 makes a massive difference in the way they brake. And they're less focused on that. Here I come up to the three. Here I come. Ah, and they hit the brakes <laughs> yeah, and they lock yeah, up. Yeah. Or they, their body is all tense. They're not relaxed. I think that's another part of it. You know, the great thing about this sport is, and we've kind of gone around this, is, is, is there's a mental part of it, but there's that physical technique part of it. Yeah. And it's the merging of the two that makes this sport so much, well, so challenging and so much fun because of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, never thought of that one before myself. And that's fascinating because it just kind of makes sense. And that links back to what you said about not thinking about it and doing it more naturally. Because I think if you're driving your road car, you don't think about the braking market. You just think about where you want to brake to. Yeah. Uh, and so that makes that makes some good sense, actually. Because one, one of the things that can sometimes happen is people don't get off the brake quick uh. enough. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that my main sort of technique focus for any driver, it's the timing and rate of release of the brakes. And the timing being, do you start releasing before you turn in, as you turn in, or after you turn in? Sort of the start of the release. And then the rate, was it a quick release? Is it a slow release? And obviously, every car, every corner is different. But the best drivers adapt that timing and rate of release to get the car to do what they want better than the drivers who are not as good. Often I'll get the question, what makes Lewis Hamilton or Scott Dixon or whoever so good? And I would say that from a technique perspective, what separates them from the people that aren't at that level, it's how they release the brake pedal. It's not the line. 
It's not when they get on the throttle. It's not where they're looking. It's not when they start braking. It's the timing and rate of release of the brakes. You can't do a good job of using that timing rate of release of the brakes if your eyes are not focused, your mind is not focused into the corner as early as you beginning to brake. You need to be there when you're at the point where you're starting to brake. So. So I get a little excited about all this stuff because it's just way cool. and No, it's fascinating. Uh, I'm just enjoying listening. <laughs> it's great. Taking notes but, here. <laughs> when you were talking about the data, and I think this is a hugely valuable tool and underutilized tool, I would say. Okay. Um, my experience is, and maybe yours is different, but my experience is underutilized in a couple of different ways. One is somebody has a data system in their car and they just don't have the time or the ability to really dig into it. And it becomes a, an expensive weight ballast or a lap timer. Lap um, timer. That, that, I mean, I would say that is unfortunately probably 90%. And I Unless you've got someone other, to help you, if you're doing yeah. it yourself, you might look at it later or the day after or midweek or something when it's, when it can't, you can't do anything about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, um, I was, yeah, go on. That's the first one. Yeah. And then the, the, the other one is they have it and they dig in so deep in the wrong areas. They miss the low hanging fruit. There's some real, you look uh, at the data and go, ah, there's that. Well, they're, they're digging into some other little thing and, and they get caught up in this wormhole in the wrong areas. So but one of the things that I see a lot of drivers do is they look at their data and they pull up their fast lap and they look at their fast lap and they're always comparing their fast lap. And I think you were talking earlier about the, the braking and how we move it in. Well, there may be, while that's your fastest lap, two laps earlier, you might have braked uh, a car length or whatever later. And if you go digging around your data for some other laps, you may find a, a lap where you did the right thing. You just only did it that one time. Well, if you could then do it that one time, doesn't that give you confidence that, whoa, not only can it be done, I actually did it once. So that means I can go and do it again. So I think it's important that we also look at some of our other laps. And the other thing is, is that then you can go, not only you pick that little segment of track and you look at the data and or video, and, and not only are you now kind of saying, this is where you would break. It's like, this is where you did break on that lap and look how yeah. it worked out. And if you start to look at segments and theoretical fastest and stuff like that you might go well if you did that piece there and just put it together with the rest of the lap you would have been three tenths quicker or whatever yeah, so i think right. that's the value of what one of the great values of data is as long as you don't get so caught up in the well i'm just going to look at my fast laps yeah you're right the challenge with most of the software that people have access to that it prioritizes the fast lap and like you say you're limited on time often yeah and so you just look at that so and, and it's quite difficult to find those patterns uh, yes you've got the segments that do work and oh, quite often i see people with lots and lots of segments and i think that's a story for another day but that's that's that doesn't help <laughs> what you want is sections of relevance which is kind of what you're talking about because you might only be one mile an hour different in this corner but it's actually carried all the way down the street and so that's the kind of section that's more interesting as overall. This, the combination of three or four corners and a straight or something is, is a bit more relevant. But finding those other things within the days, I personally actually find that quite frustrating that it's not easier to get access to from other laps. It's, it's quite labor intensive. You have to go through each lap and then try and work yeah. out, okay, you can, you can sort of try and load them all together and then reference. And it's just quite difficult to do that. But it's frustrating because the data's there. Yeah, that's why it's frustrating. Not because it's hard work. It's just because it's there. It's you can't get it easily. One of the things that I I like to do, and I again, it's time limited. Often you don't have enough time, to, but I, I'd love your opinion because I I know you're you're the guru on this kind of stuff. Is you know, I'm not a guru on anything. Well, <laughs> me, I'll take I, it. I'll take it though from you. Yeah. from you. I'll take it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, you know what. <laughs> One of the things that I like to do is I may start off by looking at the fastest lap versus the previous session's fastest lap. But what I'd like to try to do then is, is take three to five laps and overlay them over each other and just look at the speed traces for those three to five laps. And you may find that most of the speeds kind of line up pretty darn close, but there may be one corner where there's a big variance. And, and I go, well, that's where the driver is the least consistent. And that may be the biggest opportunity for improvement is just get consistent in that one area because right now the driver, maybe the driver is trying to figure out what to do there and they're trying different things. And then it's a matter of well, which one worked the best. 
but by just overlaying three to five laps, it will show the one place on the track. And it may be that it's consistent. Like they almost line up on top of each other, but it may be that there's one or two areas on the track where there's some big variances. And I just look at that and go, usually there's a good opportunity there for improvement. That's a great technique. There's two or three things there. The speed trace is quite an underutilized trace. All the information is there. The money channel, isn't it? They, some people call it, but you could discover so much from that, just that trace on its own. Yeah. And overlaying those multiple laps, because it should be one thin line. If it's not, then what's going on? And like you say, the, having the confidence in a corner is as valuable as being able to sort of nail it once every 10 times and be half a second quicker. If you can be three tenths quicker every lap, that's better because on a stint or for a race, because you're, you're going to be more consistent than that corner in a race. So yeah, it's not just about absolute pace. I think it's about giving the driver that confidence. One of the things that we've talked a little bit about is around how the driver can kind of communicate that information back to someone. Say they do have a friend or an engineer, if they're very lucky, to, who is looking at their data or even they're doing it themselves. How can they communicate that back in a way that would be useful? Because to say, for example, I'm not confident at turn three is, again, you need a bit of confidence to say that. There, there's two things there. One is the car and one is the driver, right? I don't believe that drivers just randomly go, I think I'm just going to lift off the throttle and coast through here for fun. Usually the car, the track, something is telling the driver to lift off the throttle or brake early or not get on power. If you look at an area that a driver I look at and I go, I'm slow there, or as coaching a driver, I look at and go that you're not as fast as you could be there. I then kind of start to go, well, why? What's telling you to do that? So one of the main questions I ask drivers all the time is, if you could have the car do one thing better, what would it be? And I think it kind of narrows the focus down because a lot of times drivers will get out and go, well, I guess I'm supposed to say the car is understeering here and it's yeah, understeering yeah, here. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, they've got to be an engineer now all of a sudden. Yeah. And if you just kind of go, what's the one thing that you would like the car to do better and it would help you go faster? And would you prompt them to point, do that beforehand as well? Like say like, you know, you, because this is the other this is the other challenge. Because sometimes the driver comes in and says, "Oh, I didn't think about it. I can't even remember what gear I was in mm. for turn three. <laughs> you know, like, right. I, don't, I don't know. I, they genuinely have no recollection of what just happened. Highlights, but not a, a long dialogue of every lap. So, do you prompt them to say that? Yes, and you know, <laughs> any driver that's had me coach them, they know pretty much when they get out of the car. That's one of the questions they're going to ask them. So they're they've sort of been primed and. If you prime your mind with that kind of a question beforehand, it, it's almost like your brain says, I got to answer this question later. So I'm going to store that little bit of information way back in the back of my brain. So now when I ask that question, the driver may kind of do that kind of look up in the sky and go, oh, yeah. And they're kind of accessing that little database way back in their mind and go, yeah, really, it's in turn three. I, I just don't feel like I can get back to power there. And I wish I could. So the next question is, well, what would help you do that? I would say whether you have an engineer, a friend, a spouse, uh, or just yourself, this little debrief process is really important. And if you just keep asking yourself questions and, it, and it's just like, well, what would it take to get back to throttle sooner? Or what would happen if I just got back to power a lot earlier? Well, I feel like the car would go off the track. Well, which end of the car, the nose or the rear? Again, don't have to be an engineer here, just which ends of the front ends. Okay, so if you had some more front grip when you got back to power, do you think that would help there in that corner? Yeah, that would help. So you kind of keep just drilling down, asking these questions, and that helps you kind of go, okay, that's what I want the car to do better. But then you go, well, what could you do differently with your driving maybe to help that? What happens? What would happen if you had the car rather than pointing at that angle as you pass the apex? You had it at that angle, and I'm moving my hands I here. You're, uh, you're moving your hand right now, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but, I should know, get the video set up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's an, there's an apex of a corner, but there's also an apex angle, the angle the car is at when it's passing that apex. And you can have two cars at apex in the same place, but one car is at a different angle. One car is angled in a straighter line exiting the corner. Well, what could the driver do with their driving technique? Sure, we could give the car more front grip with some changes to the setup, but let's assume you can't do that. What could you do as a driver? Well, yeah, I could try turn in later, but the downside of turning in later is it probably means I'm going to need to slow more, get the car to turn more. That might help. That's one option. Another option might be maybe if I 
kind of trailed the brakes in a little deeper, the car would kind of rotate a little bit more. And now I'd be at that better angle as I'm passing the apex. So now I don't have quite as much steering in when I go back to power. Now I'm not so worried about the car driving off the outside edge of the track at the coming out of the corner. So this process of debriefing, whether it's with a coach, a engineer, a friend, a spouse, uh, or yourself. And by the way, I think it's critical that you, you do this with a track map sitting in front of you, just a yeah. paper track map or something on your iPad or whatever. And just you're looking at it and you're going... Yeah, I'm thinking about this corner and it just helps you kind of put everything into context and start making some notes and writing things down. And in the process, you end up coaching yourself as to what you could do with your driving. But you're also kind of self-engineer, too. Like you kind of go, well, maybe if I could give the car more front grip there. Of course, you, then you have to ask, well, if I gave my car more front grip there, is there a downside? Would I make the car too much oversteer somewhere else on the track? And that might be a better compromise, but maybe not. So I think something that drivers don't do enough of after a session is kind of going through this debrief process, starting with the question of, if I could have the car do one thing better, what would it be? And then you can start getting into the details of, well, what does the car do in turn one? Well, it, it understeers. Okay. Is that on corner entry? Is that in the middle of the corner? Is that on power? Because you kind of got to break it down into where in the corner. And then what are you doing? Are you still turning in? Are you still coming off the brakes? Are you off the brakes? Are you starting on the throttle? Are you hard into the throttle? Are you starting to unwind the steering wheel at that point? And if you start to dig down and go, it's right there at that point in the corner. At that point, I am off the brakes and I'm just starting to feed in the throttle and I'm just starting to unwind the wheel. That helps you identify what to do with the car as well, like setup wise. An engineer doesn't want you to say change the damper settings or no, let's go to softer no. front springs they just want you to identify what the car is doing and if the, and if you can then give them the bonus rounds of it's right there and this is what i'm doing to the car when it does it the engineer goes oh i can fix that but when a driver comes yeah. in and says car understeers in turn one well for the engineer that's like there's still yeah. dozens of levels of things that could they don't because, believe you, <laughs> actually. Well, they don't, that's their initial reaction is like, I don't believe you. You're doing yeah. something to make it understeer. My car's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, or, or the worst one is, uh, the car is crap. <laughs> yeah, that's a good start. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, heard many, I've heard many driver or many engineers say, I can fix understeer, I can fix oversteer, I can't fix crap. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like that though. It's really that's really simple, and it also breaks it down because you can almost like park the data at this point because you, you could say if you do that and you can start to get some solid feedback there, then then that is your data because the belief system of the driver, certainly at the lower levels or the club level, is as important really as your damper settings. More important, really. I mean, if they're confident, they're going to find more time. So if you can break it down and go, yeah, okay, that's what's happening with the car, but equally reflect back on what can you do in your driving to change that in, in a sort of adult conversation. And I'm, la I'm smiling here because I can imagine drivers yeah. getting a bit flippant if they're <laughs> They're not, depending on the circumstance, you know, who's asking the question. Um, <laughs> you go and try it. It's like, okay, uh, no, 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 that's not what I meant. I'm trying to help you. Yeah, I, I, and you've seen that work. I mean, you've obviously, that works repeatedly for you, I imagine, with your drivers. As a coach, sometimes I become sort of the liaison between the driver and the engineer. The worst mm. driver-engineer relationships are when each one of them has an ego and the driver is trying to put the blame on the engineer and the engineer is trying to put the blame on the driver. And that just yeah. goes nowhere. People, I, I get asked the question of what makes a great driver great. Well, similarly, what makes a great engineer, race engineer, great? And I would say the single biggest thing that makes a difference between the best engineers and the less than best engineers, I've worked with a lot of less than best engineers who they like to look at the data, they like to look at the geometry and aero settings and all that kind of stuff. And they kind of, they don't factor in the driver. The best race engineers know that, look, I can look at data and I can look at the computer and I can do all this stuff all day long, but there's a human in that car. And I need to get the human to do what I know the computer is telling me it can do. And to me, I'm a big believer in using data, but for example, I like to debrief with the driver asking those same kind of questions that I've just talked about before we ever look at data and ideally yeah, before we even look at lap times. I would I would say that that's what you should do really because lap times are probably there or thereabouts in the sense of like they're 
they're on the screen or they're on the dash or something like that. But I would say that that conversation about what's the one thing you could change is definitely something you would, definitely a conversation you would have before you started looking at any data. What you're trying to do, in my experience, is, is you go from the end of one session and then you want to create a plan for the next time out in the car. Yes, yes. And there's a window of time. Sometimes it's overnight, sometimes it's a half an hour. And you need to go from the end of one session to a plan for the next session. How you do that, you need to understand what happens. You need to work out, okay, what that means and then prioritize of all the different things that you can do differently. It changes on the car or changes in the driving. What is it that you're going to get done before the next session and how are you going to achieve that? So it's a kind of like a science experiment in in one way. And you just say, right, okay, so now whilst we've discovered all this stuff that's maybe not optimal, we're going to focus on these areas, one or two corners or, or however people want to do it for the next session and that's what we're going to do but it's based on data in inverted commas data could be your opinion as a driver as well as what the measured sensors have to say yeah and what's interesting what was kind of going through my mind here is how many times i've had a driver get out of a car and go oh the car is terrible it's just it's junk like it just does not handle well at all and and you go oh that's interesting you're quickest that session and all of a sudden they go oh actually the car is not that bad really (laughs) <laughs> or, or vice yeah. versa. So they get out of the car yeah, and you go, yeah. how's, the, how's the car handling? And they go, it's really good. It's really good. You look at left and you're 12. Oh, well, actually now the car is terrible. Like it. So that's why I think having that first initial little debrief before getting into the lap times and lap times, yeah, are probably going to be the lap time is going to be there, but you don't know where you stand compared to other yeah. people a lot of times. But then you use the data to go, if I asked a question of well, if you could have the car do one thing better, what would it be? I'd like to be able to get back to power earlier in turn three. And then you use the data to start to dig into why and the what. And you can use that data to go to another level. And that you can use it then to kind of help draw out out of the driver even more. And one of the best things you can ever do with a driver, by the way, if you're coaching or engineering, is the driver says, I just can't get down to power. The car understeers as I come off this corner. You look at the data and you go, yeah, I can see that in the data. Well, now the driver that you've just given the driver confidence. Yeah. And you've given the driver confidence that you believe in him or her. Yeah. So, it, it, and that you just mentioned, I mean, uh, a driver with confidence will always do, do better yeah. than a driver without confidence, no matter how good a setup was on the car. Just understand that the data is a tool to then go to that next level. And a exactly. lot of times, you know, a driver exactly. get out of the car, and I don't know. But you look at the data and then the the data might point to something. You go, well, I'm seeing this in the data. What, what How's that feeling? Oh, yeah. Okay. Like it helps prod the driver as well. And I, support. I, the, data, the data has to be a support. And, and one of the things that I have seen a little bit is that people are looking at the data to be like an instructor to telling you yeah. what to do. That's the wrong way to look at it. It's really a support. It's just to give because the data isn't complete. That's the problem. You can't measure everything you need to know. You can measure yeah. bits of it, but you can't. It has issues. The data has problems, and it doesn't get to the granularity. Even at the very top level, it doesn't get there. So, what hope we have at a club level? But it can still be useful. You just have to put it in context and think, right? Okay, what is the problem here? And and so, like you say, so if you've got the, that question that you're asking or that discussion you're already having with the driver, number one, you've got the driver on board with you through the conversation. Right? So they're not standing there waiting to be told what to do, which I've seen. I've seen people do that. The driver comes in and the data guy gets the SD card out and he's putting in the laptop and, and no one's talking to each other. Or well, the driver's chatting to his mates about something and well, how they had a bit of a laugh. But no one's actually doing any debriefing. And then it's like, oh, yeah, I've got the data now. Let's have a look and see how you can improve. And no one's actually asking the driver what they think. It's just like the data is going to tell you you're slow right. and when you can improve. And here's a really good example of, first, the power of data, but also the limitation of data. Not too long ago, it was, we were testing at Sebring. And as you may or may not know, Sebring is a very, very, very bumpy racetrack, which is what gives it great character. It's a wonderful racetrack to drive. And I'm looking at the data, and I'm seeing the brake release. And the brake release is not, like to me, a brake release the brake pressure trace on a data system should have, I call a long tail, kind of a nice smooth yeah. release yeah, yeah. in most corners, right? Not all, but m- m- most corners. And I'm, and I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing kind of 
erratic and inconsistent release of the brakes. So the data pointed that out. So I'd say to the driver, I want you to go and focus on being smoother with the brake release. And it keeps showing up. So it's pointed out a problem and the driver knows there's a problem there, but it's not the fix. And then I stick my head down into the cockpit and I go, there's no heel stop, meaning there's nothing down there for the driver's heel to rest against. So now they're trying to modulate the brake pedal over bumps with their whole leg bouncing around all over the place. No hope. hope. So I, hey, to the mechanics, put a heel stop in there. They put a heel stop in there. Now the data looks great. The driver is more comfortable and we're more consistently fast. So I added one. So I have a race car and uh, it used to have pedals that were mounted at the top, hinged at the top, um, like in a road car. And we had some issues with those. So the guys persuaded me I needed to get a lower mounted pedal box, you know, because that's racing. So I bought bought this lower mounted pedal box, which is lovely. So it's all hinged at the floor and it looks fantastic. And it's got adjustable bias and all that sort of lovely stuff that I didn't have before. But I was really struggling with it. And... We tried all different things, like loads of different things. And there were some issues with the system, but I think a lot of it was to do with the way in which I was using the brake with my foot. We thought, let's just try a heel stop. I'd never had a heel stop before because of the way the pedals were mounted above. Mm-hmm. I was worried that it could, could get trapped in an accident and it would get hurt. So but yeah. as, the, as the pedal box is now mounted on the floor, it was like, well, let's try that. And I, I'll be honest with you, it was worth at least half a second a lap. This one little yeah. bit of bent metal <laughs> that just went in the bottom of the floor. Yeah. I was just, I was staggered. And a lot of times what's what's interesting in racing is you see drivers, teams, engineers focused on these wild, crazy, elaborate solutions to go faster, looking for the trick stuff. And it's like basic stuff. Make sure the driver can actually operate the controls without slipping or sliding around in the car and their feet are well positioned and things like that. So sometimes it's the simple stuff that gets you the most. Ross, I'm aware of the time. I, I, we're just chatting away here, and I just totally lo- like lost, lost track of the time. I'm loving this conversation. Thank you so much for coming. Where, where can people find you online? Well, main thing is just speedsecrets.com. I started this, uh, wrote some books a long time ago, and just started Which my Which I have most of them, by the way. I'll just sort of flag that to the audience. I bought most of the books. They're brilliant. And I'm not just saying that because Ross is on. I'm actually a bit of a fan of Ross. He's a bit in awe that he's on this actual show. <laughs> They're amazing books. Get the books, well, guys. <laughs> I, I, I'm glad. I'm, now I know the one person that bought them. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Hello. <laughs> um, but everything I do from the coaching to online training videos to every week I post a kind of a Q&A thing. I call it Ask Ross. It's just a question thing. I have downloadable PDFs of track maps, a lot of things. So if you just go to speedsecrets.com and also follow me on social media, the usual Facebook, Twitter and Instagram kind of stuff. because I post some things there that are slightly entertaining, but more importantly, educational at some point. So I often say that there's a lot of drivers who are very fortunate that they get to follow their passion. I'm one of those people that I've had two passions in my life, driving and coaching, helping other people learn. And I get to do both of them. So it's pretty incredible. You can tell it comes across, comes across when you're talking about it. It's just, it's so lovely to hear. And I know that the people listening, well, they'll be thinking about all sorts of different things now. They'll be thinking about the one thing better. I think that's such a simple thing to implement. Just go out there. What's the one thing better that you could improve? And and so much uh, about the way in which We can approach racing, the marriage with the data and the actual real stuff. I mean, there's just so much in this podcast. Uh, So thank you very much for your time. It's just, it's been enlightening. It would be lovely to have you you again on the show at some point. It's a bit presumptuous. (laughs) Let's do it again. I enjoy talking with you because I love your perspective on this thing. What you're doing in terms of spreading your knowledge and sharing your knowledge, not only is it a a nice thing to do, (laughs) but I hope it's rewarding. And I, I know that it's helping people in our sport. And the great thing is when we help other people in our sport, more people come into our sport and we keep growing this thing. So it's all fun. What a great guy. I'm sure you'll agree that was a fascinating insight into Ross's world. I hope you've been able to get several takeaways there which are going to help you with your driving. If you're interested in more of Ross's stuff, please check out his website, speedsecrets.com. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and visit us at yourdatadriven.com.